can I swear on this channel? <laughs> to be honest with you, now looking back, even when I was making the renderings with Podium, we didn't really know that you had to put a sun, that you had to put a sky. Making an image would take a lot longer than it does today. Like, you know, three images, they would be like uh, two months of work, you know? Somebody told me that, you know, managers are people that think that nine women can give birth in one month, you know? <laughs> like, I was having a conversation with my dad yesterday and he was like, but do you have money? I'm like, yes, dad, <laughs> don't worry, <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> I do think that you need to be a little bit of a troublemaker in life. I always say the difference between those who do and those who don't do is those who do. That's the difference. The, the funny thing about life is that you have to live it in order to be able one day to look back and see how all the dots connect, right? If you are for a while in the industry, you probably came across Fabio Palvelli name. He's best known from organizing D2 conferences and his YouTube channel. At the moment, he is an art director at Elephant Skin and he visited me so we can create something for you. Ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. So, what was the first time when you created the graphic, or maybe the better question will be when you fall in love in creating RVs? Oh, uh, okay. Uh, I think my first rendering was done in 2006. At the time, I was studying architecture in London, and we had to do it just for um, uh, stuff that we were doing at the university. And at the time I was working part-time in an architecture office, GML Architects in London, they still exist. I actually went to see them uh, a few months back. And I was printing my project because I had a crit in class. Basically, that's when you present your project. And my boss saw it and he was like, oh my God, this is really good stuff. Why don't you do some images for us? And so I started to do that. And then, um, uh, you know, that's how things started to, to, to move in that direction. But back then in 2006, there wasn't really an archivist industry. There were just people doing images for... Uh, there were some offices, but, you know, they were not really something that you would say, oh, I'll, you know, go and work in an architecture and visualization office. And so for me, this was just part of being an architect. Uh, but that's basically how I started. And then after those guys, there was a colleague of mine who also liked my work and said, I have my own projects, would you help me doing the images? He introduced me to somebody else, that person to somebody else, and that's how I started. But the first images like were really like 3D models with SketchUp, and then you put textures in Photoshop and do the chiaroscuro by hand, you know, like doing a lot of paintings and then put a big sky in Photoshop and and or uh, we were rendering Podium, I don't know, people probably don't even know what Podium is, but this was before v <laughs> And uh, how did you learn all of that before it was just on your own? I didn't really, like, to be honest with you, now looking back, even when I was making the renderings with Podium, we didn't really know that you had to put a sun, that you had to put a sky. For us, just the rendering by default in SketchUp was already looking like, oh my God, you know, the geometry is so realistic. And, and then we would do a lot of things in, uh, in Photoshop. Making an image would take a lot longer than it does today. Like, you know, a client would ask us to make an image. Um, we would say it takes a week, you know, and they'll be like, yeah, yeah, no worries, you have months. And so, you know, like three images, they would be like, uh, two months of work, you know, uh, back then. I'm pretty sure that there were people that were wor working already at a different speed and doing different things, but that's how I got started. And before architecture, did you have any experience with art or it yeah. was just the first? So basically, um, I, I make art since I can remember. Like even as a kid, I would come home and I would draw 
like I would tell to my mom, mom, the teacher gave us drawings as homework because then my mom would sit with me and draw with me. And so, you know, I will make a list of words that then we would have to draw my mom and I, and she would be so patient to do it with me because I didn't really know how to draw. I was like six years old. Um, and then like at the age of 12, I was already going around with my friends at night making graffitis. I got in trouble also for that at the age of, of 15. Um, then I stopped at the age of 18 because things got kind of serious. And then, you know, with 18, I already got in trouble a few times with the police and with the guards and stuff. And so I was like, okay, it's time to give it up. But then I left Italy. That's where I was doing this stuff. And I started to travel around. And so I had to work. I could not really dedicate myself to art. And then at the age of 24, 25, I was like, oh, what am I going to do with my life? And I knew that I wanted to do something with art. So I said, okay, I'll start studying architecture. And that's when I really, you know, started to go back into doing uh, everything, you know. So I was already old when I started to study architecture. I was already 24, 25. Uh, so now you are the art uh, director in Elephant Skin. So tell me how to achieve the ideal art direction. Oh, I don't think that there is a uh, an answer to that. The myself, I'm always very interested in processes. You know, um, I've been involved in this industry in many different. Uh, aspects of uh, 3D. You know, I worked for V-Ray, I worked for V-Ray for Cinema 4D, which was a company that was developing the plugin independently before V-Ray bought it. I worked, the, the, this company also had a website called 3D Tools. We were making content. Then I develop, developed my own company called, you know, the D2 Conference. Before that, I had another company called 3D Dreaming. We were making uh, tutorials, we were making uh, courses, we were making workshops. So um, every time that I was doing something, I would try to uh, optimize and find optimization ways of making things better. And so when I went to Elephant Skin, I had this idea that if I was able to create some standards that would get the artists up to speed, say in one or two days, to have, say, an image that was 80% ready, then we could have the time to talk a little bit about the arts and about, you know, some ideas, how to make the images better. Uh, and that's what I did. I started to write these uh, standards. I gave them to the artists. The artists understood what it was that we were doing. And that made the process a lot faster. You know, we went from, uh, instead of waiting for feedback on every single camera. They were capable of doing the cameras in a couple of days. And then, you know, we would talk about the general strategy of how to make images. And to me, it's not about the idea that the art director should have, but rather, you know, the ability of the art director to see where the good ideas are and just put them together. Because at the end of the day, the work is of the artists, it's not mine. I'm just trying to facilitate the process. And that was a sort of like a strategy that uh, worked, you know. And uh, what's the most challenging part of managing people for you? Oh, uh, th this is a, a, a company that has people uh, in America, uh, Canada, Brazil a lot. Now we're in Europe. We're slowly also getting into the Middle East. Uh, language, you know, culture. These are things that are really important, but also are things that make the strength of a company that it's international. Um, and also to make people understand that it's, uh, it isn't really about a hierarchy. It is about doing the right thing all the time. Um, and sometimes it just, it, it's difficult with artists because artists tend to have an ego, you know, but this is also like that component that drives them to make things better. So you have to find a way to balance, you know, the, the authority plus understand why it is that they want to do certain things so that, you know, Again, you don't sort of like force them to do stuff. You try to put them on the right direction. And uh, in general, we are so different. And you said like different culture, different languages and everything. So what do you think uh, is the way to, to handle all of that? Like what do you have to do as a manager or like creative art, uh, the art director 
like to, to be able to handle people uh, in a way that they listen to you and they don't treat you just like an authority and person who just give you the tasks, but more like a teammate, let's say. I think you just need to um, really do good work, honest work. Like to me, honest work, this is really at the base of everything. Because like if we're working on a project for a client, the uh, idea of doing honest work is that when the client gives you the work, if you study the project, if you look at different tests, if you look at different uh, ways of uh, making a vignette or a camera or, you know, an animation, and you go through um, uh, the, the, the whole um, uh, sort of like production part together, you know, with the seniors, with the product owners, with the project managers, if you do all that study, and you see what the possibilities are, then you're doing honest work because you're not just doing an image because you have to do an image, you're learning the project. And so you show to the client that you care about their project more probably than they do, right? And so if you do that, you always have a better argument than other people, I found, at least in my case. And so, you know, I'm not saying that I always want to be the one with a better argument, if a client or if an artist comes with a better argument, it is my job and the job of everybody involved in the process to say, wait a second, that's a better idea. Let's go with that one instead. And this happens all the time. I mean, in Archivist, you know, we do a lot of client revisions and sometimes clients, they come with ideas and you say, why didn't I think of that myself, you know? Um, yeah, so do honest work. If you study the project, then you know the project. If you have good ideas, better ideas, it is your duty to show it to the team. Even if they say uh, no, like, you know, if the management or even if the client says no, you should still do it for yourself just to have an idea whether or not that idea works. It has happened a couple of uh, a week ago that, you know, we created some images and I asked us, an artist to do some sketches. And the whole team was like, no, no, we don't have time for that. These are not good ideas. And I was like, okay, just give them to me. I'll try to do a little bit of post. I'll do it on my own time. Don't worry about it. We did them. We had a meeting. Those images actually ended up being the cover of the project. And so, you know, um, again, it's not about having the better idea. It's about you do the honest work. You understand what the project is. If you think that there is a possibility, you should do it. And then people will look at it and they will be like, okay, the guy knows what he's talking about. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I totally uh, understand that uh, point. And uh, I, I really feel that uh, it worked that way. That's uh, honest work and like putting effort, especially so people know that you put effort and they want to put effort too. So giving an example uh, at the high level so they can be inspired as well. Talking about the uh, team and uh, there are different generations in the teams. I'm not sure about your team, but there are younger people or older people. And uh, nowadays there's lots of complaints about, maybe not complaints, but more concerns about the younger generations that they are a bit different. They approach life differently, which makes some people struggle to handle of that and what is your approach and how do you handle that like how you communicate with uh, young artists mm. is it an issue even for you or it's nah, not really like uh, we do have uh, i do see it you know um some of the younger people they're more concerned about this idea of life balance and this was also a topic that some artists touched on at the d2 they were like, no, no, this is a meat in our industry. Um, the way I see it is that, you know, like c creativity really is a human process. You can have a render engine that it's instantaneous, but, you know, ideas and sort of like the politics of making decisions about design, those, they will never really change unless we make the decision to outsource everything to a... a, a, a omnipotent AI that can do everything. But I don't think that this will happen, you know, in the next, I don't know, 20, 30 years. I'm hoping at least because, you know, like that's the, the nice part of design, you know, making the decisions, understand what works, what doesn't. 
Uh, but we are in a position where we can make faster work, where we can take a little bit of time off of doing all the repetitive, boring tasks, and we can use that downtime to sort of like, you know, regenerate our brains and have better ideas. Because that's the other thing about creativity. You know, you cannot work 12 hours a day and be creative for 12 hours. As far as I'm concerned, I can be creative for an hour. <laughs> After that, I'm done. You know, I've reached my capacity. And so, you know, in a way, when you work as a consultant, you know, uh, you can give your time for a given amount of time. And then the other part of your job is to do other things that are not related to the work of consultant, you know. Um, in archives, when you're a designer, you basically act like a consultant on a project. You have a certain amount of skills that allow you to create those images, um, but you cannot do it for 12 hours straight. When I started out, we did not have, um, um, what do you call them, libraries. We did not have materials, and so everything needed to be created. And so one project would take that amount of time because we did not have cheat codes. Nowadays, we do have those cheat codes. That doesn't allow us to really work less or be faster. It allows us to be more creative and more effective and to create more beautiful work. Um, this is something that especially managers should understand. Somebody told me that, you know, managers are people that think that nine women can give birth in one month, you know? <laughs> Instead, creativity really is a process that it's a... Uh, a slow process, uh, it takes time, even if the tools allow you to work relatively fast. Uh, good work, the kind of work that solves real issues, that takes time. You know, you gotta put together people, uh, make po uh, different policies and politics meet and work together. Uh, clients only have like 15 minutes meetings every two weeks. So, you know, like you gotta find a way to fit all of that into that business schedule of a client. Um, so, yeah. So do you think that this uh, part of uh, work-life uh, balance actually helps uh, younger generations in being more creative and more... I think so. I think so. Like in, in, my, in my company, at least, I see that the ones that come up with the coolest ideas are actually the younger ones, but this is expected, right? I mean, the, the younger ones are coming in with fresh ideas. I, again, to me, the, the more senior you are, the more your position should be of enabling others to do what they do best. And so even with my seniors, you know, I expect my seniors to sort of like guide the juniors to being able to do their own thing as fast as possible. The, the problem often arises when you have companies that have a structure where the senior or the older people tell you exactly what to do and you have to execute. That is not creativity, that is sort of like production chain and it doesn't work. I've seen it many times, you know, companies just having this idea of like this golden standard and then that golden standard sticks for so long that then the product doesn't evolve. And there are big companies that I'm seeing, you know, stuck at that production level simply because they are like, no, no, that's how we do things. They don't let others come in and say, let's bring new, fresher ideas. So, you know, like the young people that say we want to have life balance, I, I understand them, you know, like they have the tools to work more proficiently and to, to, to do better work if they deliver. They are the one that are right. We were the one that had to struggle and had to work like 12 hours a day. So, you know, with that said, you know, there's always somebody that is lazy and comes in and doesn't want to do the work. We're just, you know, we need to make that differentiation, I feel. So we talk a lot about team, about uh, people, artists. So what is a good artist for you? To me, it's a person that cares, you know, a person that is willing to listen and a person that understands um, not necessarily how to do the things in a technical way, obviously that is also an important part, but it's a person that is willing to understand why certain things are done the way that they are. And so, you know, like, um, you'll find a lot of um, 
tutorials, for instance, on how to do this, how to do that, or how to create this effect and how to create that effect. And you will see that those videos will have a lot of views. Uh, there are a lot of tutorials where they, people talk about color theory, uh, framing, and those videos, generally speaking, they tend to be less watched because it's like, yeah, that's art stuff. We just need the technical part. Um, it's a mix of the both. And I think that, you know, like in many cases, when you're really a, a real artist, your biggest ability is to see things that are people don't see. And that cannot be taught. You can train it, but it cannot be taught. And I've seen some of these artists working in real life myself, you know, uh, during the D2 and all the things that we did. Um, you see it that they are on another level and the, the way that they perceive the world, it's totally different, you know, and um, you cannot really teach that. And so from time to time, you're lucky enough to work with some of these people and you can learn a little bit of the way the, about the way that they see the world. Um, but you also have to be open minded enough to understand that, you know, that's a good thing, the way that they look at the world, you know, because otherwise you might just think that they're silly and they don't know what it is that they're talking about. Yeah, definitely. I agree that these art topics are totally um, underestimated. Like, I'm not sure why is that? Like, probably if you are a beginner, you want to know everything about the software, about technical details, because you feel that this will give you that, you know, that, uh, that uh, output. But actually, the, everything what is behind it, it's more important, but we will have to learn it on the way, probably. Everyone in their own way, uh, that this is important too, uh, and uh, it makes the difference. You've been in the field for a while, and uh, I think you can uh, give some tips, advices. Uh, I'm pretty, you've already gave uh, lots of advices on the way, but if you could tell the advice uh, to younger uh, artists, younger people on how to live the life that um, they could be proud of, like not just in terms of the professional life, but in life in general. Uh, this is really a hard question. You, you really have to have a huge amount of um, um, self-awareness because you know there are a lot of people that think that they're good when actually you know their skills are barely cutting it and there was a period in my life where i was definitely one of those people that i thought a lot more than what i actually was and this was very humbling because like it uh, every time that i would sort of like put myself um in the game trying you know to come not compete, but like work with the pros, I would see all my shortcomings. And so, you know, this is one of the, the first thing being humble, like do understand that, you know, whether you think you're good, there are people out there that know how to do the things that you know how to do 10 times better. And that's okay. You know, it's just that you have to understand it so that you can improve yourself all the time. Um, the other thing is that you gotta be able that, uh, to understand that this is a lifelong commitment that you're making to this field. So if you want to work in architectural visualization or digital design in general, do understand that, you know, um, like your experience will come with years and years of being disappointed and having to work long hours and having to do a lot of work for very little money. Um, you do hear a lot of stories of people that, you know, make quite a decent living, but it's not everybody that does that. And, you know, especially if you work for uh, as an artist in-house, a lot of the jobs are just good paid jobs, but they're not like amazing paid jobs. So, you know, if you're doing this just for the money, no. But if you get to work as an artist, you have a privilege that not a lot of people have, which is you get to do something that you actually love, if you really love it. And this is huge nowadays because, you know, like a lot of people go through their lives, you know, being um, hypnotized by this idea that, you know, they need a new pair of shoes, a new clothes, a new holiday. And so 
they live their life spending everything that they make and you know barely surviving um, when you're an artist a lot of that fulfillment comes from the work that you do and so at least in my case i find that i don't need so many things in order to be happy because the fulfillment comes from the job um, so you know that's that's uh, another thing that i think it's worth considering um, the third one is that you gotta be you gotta be relentless you gotta be you know able to eat all the can i swear on this channel <laughs> You have to be able to eat all the shit that you're given every single day. And you gotta be able to detach yourself a little bit from your work as well. Because, you know, like, um, when you do work for others, you have to understand that some people might not like it or they might expect different things from it. And that's okay. You know, you're providing a service and so you should be servant to the person that uh, you're providing it. Of course, you know, with uh, pride and with... Uh, uh, respect for each other but you're still providing a service and so the more you do for that person for that client the more you'll be appreciated uh, little disclaimer it's not always like that but you know most of the times it is like that uh, you followed quite unusual path i know that you've been in military uh you've been a chef in michelin restaurant so like it's not typical path for uh, an artist or art director or like um, creatives in general. So how those experiences help you in your current job or like in life in general could be as well. The, the funny thing about life is that you have to live it in order to be able one day to look back and see how all the dots connect, right? Um, when, you know, like for instance, I left, um, to be a soldier because I was not happy at home. I was not happy in the south of Italy because I'm from the uh, outskirts of Napoli. So, you know, it was a very dangerous place growing up. And so I needed a change. I needed to go away. When I um, went and worked as a chef, this was because I wanted to have a little bit of money to travel and to start to see the world. Um, there are a lot of uh, lessons that I've learned from these things. Uh, for instance, you know, like when I left as a soldier uh, because I just wanted to get away, um, it's not like my life improved a lot. And, you know, like, yes, this was a, a way for me to run away, but like some of the problems that I had followed me, right? And so looking back and seeing my growth as a person, it's because when I finally accepted that there were some problems that I had to deal with and that I could ru not run away from, you know, that gave me a chance to grow up a little bit as a person. Um, in a more practical way, when I started to work as a chef, you know, I learned skills that I would have never thought would be useful. And there is this anecdote that I always tell to people when we talk about the D2 conference, uh, where I tell them, look, the D2 conference actually was born when we were having, we were about to have lunch during the very first event that I um, created and I realized that we had no food for the guests and so I went to a supermarket and I bought like a set of like cheap knives and plates and, and, uh, and you know like the most basic food and I started to make canapes for like 60 people and when we had the break people came up to us asking oh my god this food is amazing who did it? And I was like, you know, really that idea of serving people and give them, you know, make them feel at home and, and even having the food and having a place where people could hang out and talk to each other. You know, in retrospect, this is where the D2 was actually created in that moment, right? And so I never knew when I was working as a chef that one day I was going to make a conference that was going to be the biggest in the field worldwide because of the food that I was going to make, you understand? And so it's like, it's a weird way to, to look at life. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's another thing that, you know, like people should really not be scared of making mistakes of, you know, taking a leap of faith, even if you fail, because at the end of the day, things will always keep moving forward. 
And at the end of the day, whoever stands up or keeps standing up is the ones that, you know, get to win. Pretty uh, interesting in this uh, military period of yours because it's not so um, usual to talk about artists uh, with artists about those things. So, like, do you think it this experience uh, shape you as a person like you are now? I listen to some podcasts with uh, military people and like on a high level or. Uh, like soldiers, and I, I'm not talking about the wars even, but like, you know, like going to, to the service. And uh, they always seems to have like one common thing, definitely like discipline. It's like, you can really say that, but uh, there is also some more common points and I'm interested in if, if uh, you feel that it really shaped your life or it was just a period that you needed to, to take a break. I, I would say, you know, the, the way the military was set up with the what we call the leva, which is basically the, the one that you are supposed to do. Now it doesn't exist anymore because, you know, I'm not that young anymore. But when I was growing up as a teenager, I still had to do that. Um, I got to the military uh, already with my own discipline because um, I was an athlete. And so I did sports at a... Uh, competitive level so I had to train by myself because I was a skier in the south of Italy so we don't have mountains we had to go somewhere to ski so my ability to perform really was dependent on how much I was training by myself I did not have a trainer that could follow me so you know this idea was really something that I had to develop for myself uh, but that really shaped my life in a way that, you know, like I also can see through the military, I had an advantage towards everybody else, which was resilience. And so, you know, like I can give an example. When we were running, um, I was training together with a friend of mine who was also working as a professional footballer, but in a league where, you know, they don't have the money and he was trying to get into the next league. So we were in the same situation and we were supporting each other. And so, you know, we were running, say, the eight kilometers. Um, you develop that thing where you go like, okay, all I need to do is the first kilometer because after the first kilometer, all, uh, doing the second one, it's a lot easier. And when you get to three, then you're already at four. Even if you stop, you have done a four kilometer run, so you're good. But now you're at four, you can keep pushing yourself. You can easily get to six it's easy but now you're at six you can do eight and so that idea of like pushing yourself a little bit a little bit and then a little bit more a little bit more that when i went to the military i found that you know like it was incredibly useful because like a lot of people will break in the very beginning we did not have a lot of like uh, hard training but we had all the marching and the shooting and the, we also did a little bit of parachuting because i was in a unit for parachutes um, it is tough, you know, you have the, 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 everybody's trying to break you and they want you to go home. And, and so, you know, like to me, it was like, okay, I did a week. Now I can do another week. And then the, I have only two weeks and then in four weeks I graduate. And so, you know, you do the first graduation and then you continue doing your training. But the thing that really I was able to do for myself is that because I was an athlete, I started to look up all the people that were connected to the athletic center in the mountains because I really wanted to go and ski. And so I did find a guy that was in another city. So I asked for a transfer. I actually got it. I went there and I went to see this guy and, uh, you know, I had to beg him. And this guy said to me, look, if you clean the place outside of my office uh, every day, um, I'll consider it. And so every morning I would get on the bus that was going to the academy because I was in Modena doing the, the the military and I would go and sweep the office outside of the... I, I don't think I've ever told you the story, right? And so I did it. I did it for maybe a couple of weeks. That's all that it, it took. And one day I see him walking whilst I was sweeping and he screams my name and he goes like, you're going to the mountains. And I was like, fuck, I did it, you know? And then like a week later, I got shipped to the mountains. I did my uh, mountain training because basically the idea is that 
back then we were doing uh, uh, ski slope rescues and so we had to take people down. We did also like the three days march, which is this march where you have to uh, sleep outside and it's cold and it, and I did not have any equipment. So I ended up doing it with very like basic gear. It was freaking cold. There were like minus 25 degrees on top of them. It was windy and we spent like three days on the outside. And then I did uh, the, the day that I did the test, like one of my, you know, military friends was drunk. <laughs> so, because it's in the mountains and a lot of those people are from those areas. So they are heavy drinkers. My God. Yeah. And so, you know, like I had to do the, the test, basically taking care also of the drunk guy. It was a mess, but I managed, you know, and it was a, it's a, it was a beautiful year. Um, I did it on the border between Italy and, and Austria. So, you know, I was always curious a little bit about the life in Austria and then I ended up going and live in Austria after, so. Yeah, so it seems like every step in your life, like, follows to another one and it all makes sense, but you can only say that if you go back. Like, in the time, sometimes we don't think that it's the issue, we think that everything is messed up and it's like, we don't know where we want to go, but actually when we uh, uh, see and look back, It, it seems like everything in life has some purpose. There is this quote from Charlie Chaplin, Chaplin I don't know if you know it. That he says that, you know, life looks like tragedy when you zoom in and like a comedy when you zoom out. Yeah, that's the good one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, the, that you've been a uh, mountain skier and I've already wanted to ask you about it because I, uh, I read somewhere on the internet in one of, uh, on, of your interviews that you mentioned that uh, you there was a question about the books you recommend and one of them was uh, i think the book called open like uh, or i'm not sure about the title but it was about tennis player and yes. you mentioned yes. that it is um, in, like uh, close to you because it uh, relates uh, you relate to the um, father relationship you had with your own friends uh, he has with his i'm curious How it's um, helped that you've been able to become a skier thanks to uh, that? You know, the, the relationship that I had with my dad was not one of the best. And actually, the, the, the skiing was really one of those things that um, made us close. And so, you know, like living at home, as I told you, you know, I wanted to get out of the house as soon as possible. Um, my dad was a very difficult person and, you know, I say this knowing how difficult I am a person, but the reality is that uh, ski was the only thing that would create sort of like a connection between the, the two of us. And so up until I did skiing before I used to play basketball, but I'm quite a short guy. So, you know, it was fun and everything, but it didn't lead me anywhere. Then I started to really uh, do weightlifting, uh, running, you know, I was really into athletics. I did that for a little bit and I had, you know, like all this strength and power and resistance and there wasn't really any discipline that I could do it where I could compete. We did not have like a athletic competitions where I was from, but I knew how to ski. My dad was always taking me to, to, to ski. We had, um, you know, this club, which is made for the people who work in the train stations where you can go and ski with relatively little money. And so we would do this like a couple of times a year because it was the passion of my dad. And so, you know, like I, the, 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 since things were not really the best, this brought us a little bit closer. And so I did it for a while, but then I actually stopped it because it became so much a business of my father that I was like, it cannot continue like this. And so at a certain point, my prospect was to become a trainer, not a teacher, a trainer. So basically to have a team, teach them, you know, train them and, uh, and continue doing that um, career. But to me, there was always something a little bit missing. Yes, I did like the competitive aspect of things, but I wanted to do something else. I did not know what it was because like, I could not make the decision of studying art growing up because, you know, my parents were like, there is no job. The only thing that you can do is make presepi because in Napoli we have this school where they make the little statues for Christmas. 
those are called presepi. And so my dad really thought that this was the only career that I could do. And I was like, oh. So I could imagine how they reacted when you became a YouTuber. The, like, that, uh, <laughs> they had no idea. Like, the, that, uh, they had no idea. Like, to this day, I don't think that my parents really know. Like, I was having a conversation with my dad yesterday and he was like, but do you have money? I'm like, yes, dad, <laughs> don't worry. <laughs> I'm okay. <laughs> It'll never, that some things will never change. You said that uh, you lived in many countries mm, and uh, I believe that visiting countries is one of the greatest lessons we can have in life. Like, I'm curious what these travels gave to you, like how they shape. Yeah, absolutely. Like, it's it's really uh, mind opening, you know, to, to have the possibility of traveling. If you do it with the eyes of a traveler, it can give you a lot because it's it's basically like you you get a chance to see how the world works in other places you know um i visited a lot of places i lived in a lot of places i lived in scandinavia I lived in uh, austria I lived in switzerland i lived in uh, tel aviv i lived in um uh, of course italy ireland i lived in england uh, i visited many places uh, to me it's probably the easiest activity to do that can open up your eyes and show you things that otherwise you would not even be able to 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 imagine and i know that artists who are really proactive and um, do incredible work they use travel as a way to create a log of ideas you know and through photography through writing through sketching um you know, places like Japan, South Korea, India, Thailand, they're so different from everything else that we have going on in the West. That when you go there, if you really know how to look and observe, you can just get inspiration out of it. Um, to me, the having the chance to study in the UK, that was really uh, incredible because it really showed you know, a way of thinking about architecture, which was a lot different from the way they teach it in Italy. And um, then I had the chance to study in Vienna. There, it was again different. It was more taught for the people. There was a different quality to architecture, more um, sort of like um, an holistic aspect to it, like, you know, uh, Places that are designed for um, multi-functions and to bring people together also because it's colder, you know, the, the weather is a little bit uh, different from the... And so, you know, <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, uh, and so, you know, the, even now in, in Poland, this is, uh, I go around and I see amazing architecture, you know, and it's coming a little bit later than other countries, obviously. Uh, but you can see, you know, there are a lot of architects that are making incredible work and it's not comparable to the one that you will find in Italy, in Spain, you know. I'm not saying that it's better, it's just that it's a different perspective and so you get to observe it. What is the closest place I'm, I'm for yourself, like, in which country you feel the best? Oh, that's, that is really a tough question. Um, you know, I really like living in Austria. This is where I started at, I started out uh, seriously doing stuff for myself. Um, you know, because that's where I created my first company, where I was really, you know, I had an idea and a vision of what I wanted to do. Um, I have to say that I love Poland, you know, like uh, Warsaw, it's, uh, it's at the edge of uh, social evolution where you can still get away with a lot of things but you know people are starting to puzzle things together and so you know the, the, the it's it's a vibrant city Warsaw is amazing there is a lot of uh, a lot going on um, there is a lot of talent in our field and I get very stimulated by everything that it's always going on uh, plus, it's very central, you know, you can fly to Vienna in a couple of hours, in less than an hour, an hour, and, an hour and, and, and a half, something like this. You can go to London in two hours, so, you know, like, if I have a meeting with a client, I don't have to 
travel for like four or five hours, like when I was working, uh, living in the Middle East or, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's a beautiful place and the food is amazing. Like Polish food, I know that sounds like a joke because I'm Italian, but Polish food is really, really good. But, you know, I should not, I, I got told that I should not do too much commercial because people don't want tourists in Poland. <laughs> Shit. We want to keep Poland without tourists. So, uh, yeah, like, like everywhere, probably like we want tourists, but like not as much. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, let's talk about uh, D2 maybe a little bit. So uh, you're the co-founder of uh, D2 conferences and you organized uh, many events so far. What keeps you motivated to, to keep going with that and to organize things? Because I, I know that it's not an easy thing to do, to, to coordinate everything, to organize events. And people don't see those little things that are behind the scenes, but there is plenty of work. Uh, so how do you keep uh, your motivation? It's, it's, uh, it's plain and simple. The being in the middle of the conversation within the industry keeps me ahead of most of other people that are trying to figure out what's going on, what is happening. I get access to a lot of information. And the reality is that every job and every consultation that I was able to do and create was due to the fact that I was organizing the D2 because I got a chance to meet all the time the right people there and to talk to them and to do something, you know? So again, people that come to the D2 they'll tell you the same thing. The reason why they keep coming and they keep showing up, it's because they build a network with uh, other artists, with uh, other business owners. And even if you don't get anything um, commercial out of it, you still get the connection with people that understand the struggle that you're going through with which you can have a conversation because that's the biggest thing. I mean. You and your husband are lucky because you do the same thing and so you can talk to each other. But there are many people that are isolated in what they do. And so by not having access to a network of people that can actually understand you, uh, it can be frustrating, right? Yeah, definitely. definitely yeah. So I'm curious, um, who inspires you? Uh, do you have any mentors or did you have any mentors in, or teachers um, in the past? Uh, and I'm not talking here only about professional life, maybe like people who are inspired like in general in life. Yeah, I did have mentors. I had people that... Uh, um, I had mentors, I had people that uh, I looked up to. I still look up to, but you know, like we outgrew each other. And, and so... Now I'm in a position that it's a little bit weird because it's it's a little bit difficult to to find a mentorship because I'm already at a level where, you know, I'm, we are at the top of the pyramid with everything that we do. So now, for instance, I, I one thing that I do is, um, um, a, um, uh, what do you call it, therapy because you know like the issues that i'm dealing with are different from the ones that i was dealing like uh, five to ten years ago uh, and this is i think it's a normal um it's a normal uh process in the life of a professional you know you get to um understand you know in your field what it is that you're doing and then you have to sort of like understand other things about your life and now with this uh, therapist, we uh, we had very long sessions up until a couple of months ago. And now we're doing it once a month. We do general checks where we make sure that, you know, everything is on track. Um, it doesn't get easy. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's always, there is always something new that you have to deal with, especially, you know, when you cover a position where you're responsible for, you know, also of so many people and also like for the clients that you're um, interfacing with. Um, but I recommend everybody to get a mentor, even if you are not comfortable with the idea of like having somebody who can mentor you, at least try to get conversations going. Uh, I still do that with quite a few people from the industry. We have r relatively regular calls with each other. Uh, is just a fantastic thing, you know, it gives you the, the possibility to 
talk about issues and to really, um, you know, see everything that is going on in your head and everything in front of you and it can help you rationalize it. Yeah, I um, I've been always interested in psychology and how human works and I always want to understand everything like I, I keep asking myself questions why some someone done something or like what's the reason behind it like the, there has to be the reason it's not just as simple and uh, you mentioned that therapy sometimes to understand your decisions now you have to go back and if you just go through it like if you talk with someone about it it just like relieves you and really gives you a position where you can uh really like start living the full life mm -hmm. yeah although it's still very difficult because like no amount of therapy can really help you to live your life until you make that decision that you want to live your life but i do see that you know like uh, once my therapist started to put me in front of the issues that i was dealing with and she made me understand look you're really in charge and it's because of you that certain things are not happening that really shook me to the point where I was like, okay, we're doing it, we're doing it. And I see it also with the, with the D2, for instance, now the D2 is becoming an international event. It's not only the Vienna one, we're planning a Brazil event, we're planning a Romania event, and we have one in the pipeline for India as well. So, you know, everything is coming together. And I do think that it's also because of the fact that I'm working on myself that this is finally happening, you know? Yeah, and that uh, definitely helps and like it can like give you this relief and so we can keep going and not don't stop at certain points. And sometimes looking at yourself from different perspectives from like and talk with someone who doesn't know you as much and ask you lots of questions because, because he or she wants really know what the issue is. It's really um, worth and uh, yeah, it's... I feel that everyone should... Um, not necessarily go to therapies, but start asking yourself the questions about how certain things in life that happened uh, shaped our lives and is it the reason that we keep going or it's something what holds us back? No, you're totally right. And yeah, it's... Uh, I also say it, you know, like, <laughs> if you can afford this, <laughs> then don't. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, we've uh, been talking about mentors before, so... What do you think, uh, what makes a person a good mentor? I think it's uh, their ability to uh, talk to you without being judgmental about things and also to being good listeners. Because like at the end of the day, the mentor doesn't really need to know more than you do. What they need to be able to do is to hear you and sort of like make you tell them the things that you need to hear for yourself. And and so the, the, when I told you that I outgrew some of my mentors, it's because at a certain point where certain things started to shift in our industry, one thing that I've realized is that every time that I would talk to them about these things, they would discard them as not the right way of doing it or like, no, that's not a technology that makes any sense. And so we would see a lot of possibilities in certain things and they wouldn't. And so, you know, instead of like making us talk, they would just, or making me talk, they would just say, no, 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 there is nothing there. Don't worry. Don't, don't even look, don't even bother. And so, you know, at a certain point I understood, okay, um, you know, there, we cannot really help each other anymore. Because that's the thing, you know, they were mentors to me like I was mentor to them as well. And in many cases, we were also like really helping each other business wise, you know. Um, and yeah. And I know that you don't like uh, to hear that you're a famous person. <laughs> I, 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 I saw that and I'm not going to do that. But you were definitely well known in the industry. So, do you see yourself as mentor for uh, other artists, even those ones who come to D2 conferences or who uh, watched your YouTubers before or um, who have uh, connections with you? You know, the thing about 
you telling me that I don't like to be famous is because there was a period where at a certain point doing content I really started to think of myself as a famous person and looking back it's such a stupid thing because it's like everything that I was doing was just to try and help other people get better at their job and so for a little while I do feel like I lost a little bit the track on what it is that I was doing. The other thing of being a mentor to other artists, I don't think that I'm the right person because I don't consider myself a great artist. Like, everything that I do is still pretty average, you know, honestly. Um, what I do, though, I do consider myself a person that can understand things in a very logical way. And so, you know, my entire work and career of consultant was simply because you know, maybe because I'm from the south of Italy, I'm very pragmatic about certain things. And so I have that ability to sort of like skim a little bit the bullshit and see where there is an, an opportunity or, or not. Sometimes I also get it wrong, you know, it's something that everybody uh, can do uh, or will do eventually. Uh, but I do not think that I could be a mentor to artists in the way of how you can make things better. Um, but I do consider myself having a good judgment of the, uh, on having a good judgment of what it's good work and what it's bad work. And you know, like this is something that, for instance, um, I've used also to grow the D2 conference because, like, our conference really we got lucky because the people that we were choosing and we were using as speakers they went on to do things that, you know, like, people were like, two or three years later, oh my god, I've seen that guy at the D2, right? Because we were able to see it before it happened. And so, you know, names like uh, Ashtorp or Beeple, uh, Nikita, you know, the, the guy from uh, all the uh, animations with Cinema for the... We had those guys before they became famous, you know? People went to see, uh, went to sell the artwork for 69 million, the NFT, and and then the the whole thing for 100 million. It was crazy, right? Uh, and we had that guy as a guest in 2017. So you know that's like six, yeah, six years earlier, right? Uh, so I do think that you know I have that ability to see what good work is. Now it's not a question of like seeing what pretty work is, but what good work is, you know, what satisfies certain uh, criteria, right? And and so I do think that I have that ability, probably. I don't even know. <laughs> you mentioned a uh, YouTube channel uh, before. Uh, actually, I brought it up. Uh, so uh, what was the reason for you to start YouTube channel? Actually, I don't even know, like I had, um, it, it, at that time I was working for v for Cinema 4D and so this was a, um, a brand new experience for me, I was making a lot of content for them, um, also for this 3D tool uh, website, and so I was making a lot of images uh, which weren't really for clients, they were for us internally, and uh, so you know, I thought Okay, you know, the work is okay, but it's not really like commercial work that you do for a client. So I wanted to have a creative outlet where I could do things for myself, you know, because I was bored of making images, I was already doing it for work. And so I started with video. I just wanted to make some vlogs, you know, I had this idea since forever, since I was at university. Actually, some of the first vlogs that I made were from like 2007 or 8. Uh, I still have them somewhere recorded, but they're so cringy that, you know, like... Um, and so I just wanted to make videos to, to have a creative outlet. And then somehow they started to get traction. People were watching them for some reason. Total strangers, people that are, st are still watching them now when I put out something, but I, I don't that much anymore. Um, and then I made a video one day where I talked about being an archivist artist because people were asking, what's your job? So I described it, you know, it wasn't an, uh, a really non-important video, but people started to ask questions and they were like, oh, how much do you charge? How, much, how is this? How is that? And so, you know, like the conversation started to become bigger, kept making videos on the topic of archivists. 
uh, I was like, okay, here there is something. People are really interested in this. Uh, at the same time, you know, we were already in conversation with the people from Chaos Group to buy V-Ray. They were asking me to make content for them, so I did that. They flew me to Bulgaria a couple of times. Um, you know, they flew me to some conferences, so I was making all these vlogs and all these things. Um, so, you know, it was a way, like, this is the thing, you know, you you should always do something because you never know what can happen. And, you know, that's your case. Look at that, what you have built for yourself, you know. Uh, by doing something, you actually get to do something, you know. And I always say the difference between those who do and those who don't do is those who do. That's the difference, you know, and so, uh, and it goes with work as well, you know, sometimes we have projects with clients where we have no idea what it is that the client wants. If we just sit around and wait, we will never know. And so it's better to make an image where the client goes like, no, this is absolutely shit, because, you know, you're doing something and they'll give you feedback and then you'll fix it and, and you know, this will move the conversation forward. But perhaps this is also another skill that I have because like the relationship that I have with my partners is that I make a lot of trouble for them. And then Jason, which is the guy that it's more or less in charge of like the communication with the sponsors and to do the graphics and everything. He always goes like, oh, man, what the hell are you doing? And so he fixes it and he does it better than me. And so I'm like happy. Uh, but the other guy is like uh, Christian, which is in charge of money and payments and everything. I just drops bomb on him and uh, a bomb on him, and and he goes like, oh, and now he has to fix stuff. And so if you do that, if you keep bothering people, then you know, like you'll get things going. And I do think that you need to be a little bit of a troublemaker in life. Like it's always better to say sorry, I made a mistake, and then you know, like, but to wait for. Approval, that's always a bad strategy. Always, always. Yeah, if you want to do something, you have to make your own mistakes. Because, like, if we do things, we do mistakes. So that's when you you know that you can learn from anything um, in life. Yeah, and definitely um, that's, uh, that's the case. Also, uh, it seems to me that you really like to talk with people, like, uh, like having conversations in general. And... Uh, you uh, you have done many interviews back then. So, what these talks, these conversations, uh, give to you? Well, you know the thing is that um, so sometimes I don't, one good thing of like making content is that you get a chance to talk so much about the stuff that you're interested in, that you even if you're not an expert, you become an expert in your own thoughts. And this is something that I always tell also the my artists, you know. I tell them, look, if you have an idea and you know that what you're doing kind of makes sense, exercise yourself in the front of the mirror because the more convinced you are of your own thoughts, the more people will buy into that. And, you know, some people might think that this is a fake it until you make it, but it is at the base of every negotiation, you know. If you feel confident about what you're saying, you'll have a better chance at selling your point of view to to, to, to somebody else, you know? Uh, yeah, okay, so thank you so much. Uh, I hope uh, guys uh, will enjoy that and uh, I'm pretty sure um, we'll see each other next time and we can talk Thanks again. So yes, sir, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. By the way, let me know in the comments how you like this format and if you would like to see more videos like this one. See you soon in the next video. Bye bye!